Established in 1936, the Baseball Hall of Fame consists of 333 of the finest people who have influenced the game of baseball. Players who have had 3,000 hits and 500 home runs are likely to be elected to the Hall of Fame. Pitchers with 300 wins, 300 saves, or 3,000 strikeouts could also get in. Anyone enshrined in Cooperstown has shown unbelievable amounts of perseverance and has had consistent success throughout their career of 10 seasons or more. Less than 20,000 people have appeared in a major league game in its 150-year history, and only about 1% of those have left their permanent fingerprint on baseball with a plaque in Cooperstown. These players have redefined the game with their hard work, perseverance, and passion. They've decided to make the game better as they gave their all every single day. Only the best of the best have reached Hall of Fame status by becoming the greatest baseball players of all time. And there's not just a baseball Hall of Fame, there's a football Hall of Fame, there's a hockey Hall of Fame, there's a soccer Hall of Fame, there's a basketball Hall of Fame. Just about every major sport, minor sport, has a Hall of Fame. There's also a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there's a Jazz Hall of Fame, and there's a Polka Hall of Fame. Something about polka just makes you smile when you hear the word. Just say the word polka. Polka, polka, polka. Just makes you happy, doesn't it? There's a TV game show host, Hall of Fame as well. There's a World Wrestling Federation Association, Hall of Fame as well. But the greatest Hall of Fame of all is found in Hebrews chapter 11. It is God's Hall of Fame. God lists one person after another after another who by faith trusted in God even when nothing in their life made any sense at all. So, so far, we've gone through two different people that we've learned about in the Hall of Faith. The first one was Enoch. Enoch was a man who walked with God, and then he was no more. He so pleased God that he never tasted death. There were only two people who never died, Enoch and Elijah. Elijah was caught up in a fiery chariot. So Enoch so pleased God that God took him up to heaven. And then last week, we looked at Noah, didn't we? And we looked at the fact that Noah was faithful, that he persevered for 120 years. He built an ark 500 miles away from any body of water. And people came out. They laughed at him. They made fun of him. They criticized him. They said all kinds of terrible things about him. But Noah lived his life for an audience of one. Now, today we're going to the father of our faith. That's the next person that we're going to look at. His man, name is Abraham. Uh, and we first meet him in Genesis chapter 12. His name is Abram. God later changes his name to Abraham. And God makes a deal with Abraham. He says, listen, if you follow me, if you serve me, I will make you the father of a great nation. And so Abraham goes through a series of tests. Now, this is the same thing that's going to happen to you. God wants your faith to be strong, and so he's going to bring tests into your life. In fact, the Bible says in James chapter 1, starting with verse 2, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when testing comes, when God tests your faith, you consider it joy. He's trying to develop perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work because he wants you to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the question I have for you today is this, are you up for the test? Are you ready for the test because there's been students that I found this week on the internet that were not ready for the test that was given to them. These are actual answers that kids gave on tests. Let me show you one. What ended in 1896? <laughs> this kid wrote 1895. That's a smart aleck right there, wouldn't you say? <laughs> How about this one? Find X. Here it is. We just need to pray for teachers right now. School's going to be starting in a few days. We just need to pray for them, don't we? That's what we need to do. How about this one? Where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? At the bottom. <laughs> oh, you got to love kids, don't you? I tell you what. How about this one? Write greater than or less than. So he thinks it's a parenthesis, so he just writes or the whole way down. Oh, poor kid. All right, let's move to the next one. Uh, the difference between 180 and 158 is 22. That's, that's correct. 
Explain how you found your answer in problem four. Math. <laughs> they were looking for a little more detail with that one. How about this one? What's the highest frequency noise that a human can register? <laughs> Mariah Carey. And here's what's interesting. The student got it right. That is the correct answer right there. It is, in fact, Mariah Carey. You know, God brings a series of tests to Abraham. Now, some of these tests he passes with flying colors. Some of these tests, I'll be honest with you, I'm not certain that he ever passed those different tests. But these three tests we're looking at today are the same three tests that God wants to put you through as well. He wants you to have perseverance. He wants you to be mature and complete. And whatever he puts you through, he's getting you ready for what lies ahead. So what are these three tests? Well, the first one is called the test of surrender. The test of surrender. Let's look at what the Bible says here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. All right, it's a test of of, of sacrifice, right? I mean, of surrender. That's what he's asking him to do. So God comes to Abram and he says, listen, I want you to leave everything you know. I want you to leave your family behind. I want you to leave your livelihood behind. I want you to get your possessions, get your wife, and I want you to go off and I'm going to lead you on the adventure of a lifetime. And I'm going to give you greater dreams and hopes than anything you've ever had for yourself. All those hopes and dreams you once had, those are going to pale in comparison to what I have for you. I've got such an adventurous, exciting life for you. So if you'll come and you'll follow me, I will make your name great. I will make you the father of a great nation. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? This is the same thing that Jesus does with us as well, isn't it? Jesus says, listen, if you repent of your sin, if you believe that I died on the cross for your sins and I rose again from the dead and you asked me to come in your life and forgive you of your sins, I will lead you into the greatest life possible. But you've got to leave behind your dreams. You've got to leave behind your hopes. You've got to leave behind what you thought was your purpose. And you've got to rather surrender now to me, to my will. You've got to do what I want you to do, go where I want you to go, say what I want you to say, sacrifice what I want you to sacrifice. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And he says, listen, if you do this, if you'll do this, I'll show you abundant life on this earth and eternal life in heaven. You will have the time of your life. Now, some of you, you've heard the call of Christ. And you've heard that life of adventure about leaving your hopes and dreams behind for something greater, for what he has for your life. And you're living that great adventure. But there are a lot of people that say, you know what, I really, I really don't want this. I really don't want this. I mean, I know a lot of people that say they, they want just enough Jesus to save them, but not enough Jesus to change them. Do you know what I'm talking about? So they want just enough Jesus to get into heaven, but they don't want Jesus messing with their life. I'm going to tell you three different groups of people that will never ask Christ in their life until they humble themselves and repent of their sin. You ready for the first group? It's called the narcissist. The narcissist. The narcissist is the person who thinks the whole world revolves around them, and every decision should be about them. That everything should be all for their praise, all for their glory. Whatever they want, that's the way it needs to be. It's all about pleasure. It's all about themselves. And then Jesus comes along and he says this. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And the narcissist is like, what? I don't want that. Deny myself. I don't want to deny myself anything. I want to enjoy everything that's here. I, I, I'm a hedonist. I'll go after anything and take up my cross. That means i got to die to myself, die to my dreams, die to my hopes. And what narcissist would ever do that? And then he says this, and you do it every day. You mean this isn't once in a while? This isn't when I feel like it? This is every single day. I mean, get up and I do this every single day. And Jesus says, yes. And the narcissist says, no. Don't want any part of that. Let me tell you another group of people that don't ever ask Christ to come in their life. That's the greedy. This is the person who thinks that the life is about possessions and getting more and more for yourself, right? This is the person who's got the three-car garage that can't fit a car into the actual garage because they got so much stuff. And then they've got some off-site storage facilities as well that they're paying hundreds of dollars for every single month because it's all about accumulating more and more and more and more and more. It's about the bling, cha-ching. It's about the latest update. It's about the latest uh, gizmo or gadget that's out there because that's where you find your self-esteem. That's where you find your worth. And then Jesus comes on the scene and says this. 
Don't you store up for yourself treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. No, you store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. And then it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is as well. That's the next verse. So Jesus just kind of calls out the greed. He says, listen, it's not about this. It's about this. You're, you're, you're blessed so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. And the Greek says, oh, no, 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 no. It's all for me. It's me, 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 me. It's about a bigger car, bigger boat, bigger house, bigger whatever. I just need more for myself. They'll never take seriously the call of Jesus in their life. To leave everything behind and to follow him, greedy people don't do that. Let me tell you one more. It's the power-hungry person. The person who thinks that we're put on this earth to make our name great, right? Because all the praise and all the glory should go to us. Did you see what I did? Did you see what I accomplished? It's to get the corner office, to be the CEO, to be the big dog, the headshot, and make sure everybody knows about it too. But then Jesus says these disturbing words to the person who's full of pride. He says, the greatest among you, well, you need to be a servant. You need to put the needs of other people ahead of yourself. True greatness isn't in you being great. It's in you putting the needs of other people ahead of yourself. So God comes to Abraham. He says, listen, I've got this dream. I've got this hope for your life. And it's better than anything you've ever dreamed or imagined for yourself. But in, for you to follow through on this dream, you've got to, you've got to surrender. You've got to take on my hopes and my dreams and my thoughts for your life. You need to go where I want you to go and do what I want you to do. And if you do this, Abraham, I will make you the father of a great nation. I will bless you, and you'll be a blessing to other people as well. And Abraham sat back and said, sounds pretty good to me. You see, he wanted something greater, didn't he? And he believed God had something greater. And I guess that's the question I have for you. Do you really believe that God has something greater for your life? Because here's the deal. The call of Jesus, when he calls you to come to him, he's not asking for a portion of you. He wants everything you've got. I, I remember years ago, I came home from work, and my wife said, let me tell you a story about something that happened today at the park. My kids were very young. I think Mackenzie was around nine. I think Hannah was around six. Cammie was around two. Well, they're, they're over playing. Cammie's in her stroller and just chilling. And there was a little boy, several kids who were going up this slide and going down the slide. They'd come around and get in line. But one boy who was three years older than everybody else in the line, he kept going down the slide. Then he kept getting in front at the front of the line. He kept cutting in the line. Well, Mackenzie is my oldest daughter, and she's not a confrontational person at all. She'll, she'll let somebody just get ahead of her because she doesn't want to deal with the drama. She's just like, whatever, whatever, just don't mess with me. Don't hurt me, okay? Just go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But Hannah, my middle daughter, well, she's more like her dad. Okay, um, she, she believes in justice for all, you know, and, and she just kept saying to her sister, this isn't right. This isn't right. What that boy's doing, it isn't right. And Mackenzie's like, hey, just chill out. You know, just chill out. We'll get our turn, okay? It's no big deal. Well, that kid made a mistake. And the mistake that he made was he got in front of Hannah. Hannah was not having it. And she grabbed a hold of the guy, turned him around. She said, hey, what you're doing's not right. You stop cutting in line. You go to the back of the line. Now, this kid's about a head taller than Hannah. And he looks at her and tries to intimidate my daughter. He said, do you want a piece of me? Now, I've taught Hannah verbal judo. Judicy, okay? That's where you try to calm the situation down. You say, oh, man, it's, it's, it's cool. It's all right. No worries. Hey, I like your shirt. You go right on ahead, right? Because that's not something. Bulldog whoop a skunk. It's not worth it, right? That's the way that works. He said, do you want a piece of me? Hannah said, no. And then with fire coming out of her eyes, she said, I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then she flinched. <laughs> and you know what that kid did? He ran off to cry to his mama, the big old mama's boy that he was. Friends, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When God comes to you, he says, I want the whole thing. I, I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing. And God doesn't flinch because God doesn't need to. So here's the first test. How are you doing on this one? Have you surrendered all the areas of your life over to him? 
And here's what's interesting. For some of us in this room and some of us at home, immediately something came to your mind. Immediately something came to your mind that you've been telling God to stay out of. You know, for some people, they say, you know what, God, you can stay out of my marriage. I know as crazy as that sounds, but people, there are people that do that. They come to church, and then they go home, and you cannot tell that Jesus is the centerpiece of their home because they never bring Jesus to their house. They never read the Bible together. They never pray together. They, they, they don't study God's word. They don't talk about spiritual things. They do their one hour because it's kind of an hour of obligation, but then they go off and they live however they want to live, and they wonder why their marriage struggles. It's because they told Jesus to stay out of it. I wonder how many 20-somethings and 30-somethings, you know, you're in the dating scene, you're a teenager, you're in the dating scene right now, and, and, and you just say, you know what, God, you stay out of this one, God. You know, don't tell me who I can date, who I can't date. Don't tell me what I can do, what I can't do. I will do what I want. Listen, you can have this portion of my life, but don't you dare touch this right here. This is mine. You know what I found to be true? Whatever you're holding back, whatever you refuse to surrender, this is what's jacking your life up. This is what's messing you up. This is what keeps you up at night. This is where the guilt and the regret come from because you're controlling an area of your life that you're supposed to be giving that area of your life over to the Lord. Could be the area of your finances. You know, I don't, God's not going to tell me how to spend my money. It's my money. No, it's not. Everything you are, everything you hope to be is God's. And you were blessed to be a blessing to others. Ah, now you do that. I bet your finances are jacked up. I bet you come here and you worship the Lord or you're at home and you worship the Lord and you don't support this thing financially. And every time you see a baptism, every time you see a new church being built, every time you see a mission, you know you're not a part of it. At least not financially. And that's got to bug you just a little bit, don't you think? I know people that tell God, stay out of my entertainment. My goodness, you can't have Jesus in your car because Jesus wouldn't want to be in your car with what music you're thumping through that puppy. The filthy stuff that's coming out of there, or what you're watching on your computer or on your phone or on your TV. Jesus can't sit next to you and say, hey, Jesus, you just, you just stay over there and you just read the paper, okay? You're old. You read the paper, okay? That's what you do. I'm over here. Not Abraham. Abraham said, here it is. Everything I am, everything I hope to be, whatever you want is what I want. That's all that I want. What you want is all that I want. I surrender it all. And here's what's interesting. We say that, don't we? We sing that. But do we do it? H how are you doing so far on the first test? Let me give you the second one. This is the one that Abraham fa fails again and again and again and again and again. It's called the test of waiting. So God comes to Abraham and Sarah, says, listen, I'll make you the father of a great nation. Here's the problem. Abraham's 75. His wife is 65 years old. They don't have any kids. They're well past the childbearing years. And so they think that when God says, hey, you're going to have a child, he's going to have the promised child, he's going to be a great nation, they think it's going to happen immediately. Like Sarah's going to get pregnant in the next couple of weeks. But God has them wait for 25 years. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't? You ever had that happen to you? You ever been in a hurry when God was, wasn't in a hurry? So here we have Abraham. I surrender everything, everything I am, everything I hope to be. I just trust in you, God. And you think, man, Abraham, you're starting off so good. Look at what happens 10 verses later. It says, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while. And then look what he says to his wife as they go into the town. He says, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife. Then they'll kill me, but will let you live. Say you're my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her stake, and, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. Okay, time out. Did we just read what I think we just read? How is he going to be the father of a great nation if he doesn't have a wife? He just told his wife, he said, hey, tell everybody you're my sister because you're smoking hot. That's amazing right there because Sarah is 65 years old. This is before Botox. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, wow. She's a 65-year-old hot. He says, say you're my sister. And then Pharaoh comes and says, hey, uh, uh, a sister of yours, I'd like to have her part of my harem. He says, what will you give her for me? 
It's like he's doing a first-round pick. I got a first-round pick. What will you give me? Oh, I'll take some camels. I'll take some cows. I'll take some livestock. I'll take some men servants. Some ma- Is that what just happened? If you ever feel bad about where you're at in your relationship with God, just ask yourself some simple questions to make yourself feel a little better. Have you ever told your wife to tell others that she's your sister? Has anybody done that? Anybody at all? Anyone? Anyone? No takers? No one's done that. All right. Has anybody uh, traded your wife? Uh, anyone traded your wife uh, for camels, uh, donkeys, uh, cows? Anyone? Pokemon cards? Anybody? <laughs> anybody at all? Anyone for a car? I, no, you did not do that. It's, well, it's sick and wrong, isn't it? What, what's going on with Abraham? What, what, what's, what has happened to this guy? We thought he was so solid. Well, he's afraid. He said, listen, when we go into town, you're so smoking hot, the Pharaoh's going to see you. He's going to kill me. He said, don't tell him I'm married, do you? It's hard to have faith in God when it's your neck on the line, isn't it? One of the things that I know to be true is it's always between faith and fear, isn't it? And one or the other is going to win. And with all the stuff we see every single day of all the things we need to be afraid of, I think sometimes fear wins the day, don't you? When God says, I'm greater still. But do we believe it? Do we believe that he's still in control? Because I know this, when fear starts getting the best of me, my God gets very, very small, and his power gets very, very small as well. They're waiting on the Lord. And while they wait, they get afraid. Let me ask you a question. How many times you wait on the Lord and you got scared? You know, when, when am I going to get married? And then the anxiety get you, right? When am I going to be financially stable and the bills begin to pile up? When are we going to have that child? You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. And still no child has come. And I wonder if you've gotten to the point where you pray now and you just kind of end it and you walk away and you go, I I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And that's where Abraham is at. God comes and he intervenes and he releases Sarah from this harem and, and they, they, they head out of town. And, and in Genesis chapter 15, fear is getting the best of Abraham. And he needs some reassurance. I think some of you, you need some reassurance that God's got this, that God is faithful. So he grabs Abraham and he says, come out, come out of your tent. And he came out of his tent and, and, and God said, look at the stars in the sky. Try counting all those. Abraham, I promise you that your descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky. But you wait on me. You be patient. You trust me. You trust that I know what I'm doing. Don't take matters into your own hands. You know what I found to be true is that whenever I make a decision out of fear, it's always the wrong decision. And I always end up making a bigger mess out of stuff when I make a decision out of fear rather than making a decision out of faith. Well, you would think that this would help Abraham, that he would be stronger as a result of this, right? That Abraham's back on track. God just reassured him. That's not so much what happens. Remember, he fails this one again and again and again. Chapter 16, Abraham is uh, hanging out, and Sarah, his wife, comes to him, and she says, you know, the Lord's kept me from having children, so why don't you go sleep with my maidservant? Perhaps I can build a family through her. And then I love the simplicity of the next sentence. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. If you insist, I will take one for the team. And I will sleep with the younger, very attractive maidservant. But only, hey, I just want to please you, Okay. So he does. He sleeps with Hagar. Abraham and Hagar have a son. His name is Ishmael. And all the Arab tribes, all the Arab people come from the line of Ishmael. Then later, God gives the promised child, which is Isaac. And all the Jewish people come from the line of Isaac. So the Arabs hate the Jews and the Jews hate the Arabs. And it all goes back to the place when Abraham wouldn't wait upon the Lord's timing. And that's why there's no peace in the Middle East. Friends, your job, my job, is to wait upon the Lord. And what he does while we wait in us is more important than what we're waiting for. 
we're learning some lessons that only waiting can teach us. That's the way that this works. Look at what Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. God wants to strengthen you while you wait. God wants to show himself supreme to you while you wait. So how are you doing so far? These tests aren't easy, are they? We've got the test of surrender. We've got the test of waiting. And the third test is the test of sacrifice. Now, we're 25 years past, okay? They have had Isaac, the promised child. He's now a teenager, and he is everything to them. I mean, they love this kid more than anything else on the face of the earth. He is the apple of their eye. I can just imagine Abraham and Isaac going out playing catch and fishing and hunting and do all the fun things together. I mean, this kid doesn't give them one ounce of worry, one ounce of trouble. And everything is just the way it's supposed to be. God has made his promise true. He's been faithful. He's brought the child at just the right time. And then look at what God does next on this test. Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, it's only a test, but in fairness to Abraham, he doesn't know it. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. What? What? What, 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 what would you say? What would you do? God comes to you and says, listen, I want you to sacrifice your child. I want you to sacrifice the promise. I want you to give it up. And you look at that and you go, this doesn't make any sense. This, is, this goes against everything that I know about God. I mean, there are other false pagan gods that tell people to sacrifice their babies to them, but not you, Lord. You would think that Abraham would have some kind of response where he says, I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. This goes against your very character. Let me make this one a little more personal, at least to me. You can flip through your phone and make it personal to you. God's blessed me with uh, three daughters. I love each of my children. Mackenzie, Hannah, Cammy. I had to pick one of my three to bring this illustration to life, and so I picked my youngest daughter, Cammy, because I have more pictures of her on my phone than I do the other, other three. But this is, this is my baby girl, Cammy. And this kiddo has brought so much joy to my life and to my wife's life. And she is hilarious. She has a wonderful sense of humor. When she comes into a room, she just lights the room up. She's always lifting other people up. She's always encouraging them. If you know anything about this daughter of mine, she's the one who is the gymnast. She was a two-time state champion, two-time runner-up. Proud dad, just wanted to make sure you knew that. She uh, broke her back in gymnastics. She has had three surgeries so far to try to fix her back, and she has had two procedures. All of them have not been successful. My daughter walks in pain every single day of her life, and we're going to have another surgery for her in the next few weeks, and I really would appreciate your prayers but that kid never gripes or moans or groans or complains. She just continues to walk through life, having the time, trusting God in ways that I don't fully understand or even comprehend. And I have had a great time with this kid. So God comes to me and he says, you kill her. That's not happening. And there's not a parent here that would sacrifice their child. You know what your response would be? If you want someone to die, you kill me. You kill me. But you don't kill my kid. Now, here's what makes zero sense. Abraham doesn't argue. He doesn't moan. He doesn't groan. He doesn't gripe. He doesn't complain. He's obedient. He's gotten to the place where he trusts God in such a way that even when his whole world is caving in around him, he just won't let go of the Lord. 
Look at what happens next in this story. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and settled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. He doesn't delay, does he? Grabs a couple of servants, grabs his son. They say, we're going to Moriah. Doesn't tell his wife. That was smart that he didn't tell his wife what he was doing. Verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. What does that tell you? It tells me that Abraham's weak. He's over 100 years old. Doesn't have much spring in his step anymore. Doesn't have any muscles on those bones anymore. And Isaac's a teenager. So Isaac carries the wood. Abraham carries the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father... Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham knows exactly what's ahead. He, he knows what he has to do. And so they, they get to the place of the sacrifice. And now Abraham has to explain to his son that God has revealed that he has to sacrifice him here on this mountain. Now, if you're Isaac, what would your response be? You'd say, hey, Ted, I don't know what you're listening to, but that's not God. That's not the God that we know. I, I, I think that's the lasagna you ate last night, Dad. I don't think that's God at all. And I think he would have probably fought with him, don't you think? Wouldn't you have said that? If your dad comes at you with a knife and says, God's told me to kill you, wouldn't you say, whoa, hey, Dad, oh, hey, hey, hey. Let's call 911 and get you in a little white room with a padded cell, right? Isaac could have run away. Abraham's well over 100 years old. Isaac's a teenager. He can outrun his dad. He can run so fast his dad will never see him again. But he doesn't. He says, if that's what the Lord wants, then that's what we'll do. Isaac was willing to lay down his life. Now, this is a foreshadowing of something that's going to happen in the New Testament, right? God the Father is going to lead his son to Golgotha, the place of the skull. God the Father is going to allow his son to be beaten beyond recognition, nine-inch nails in his hands and his feet, and a crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus will willingly lay down his life so that we can be forgiven of our sins. Isaac was willing to lay down his life if that's what God wanted him to do. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and then he took that knife. And he got ready to plunge it into the heart of his child. Now, here's the question we got to ask ourselves. What in the world was he thinking? Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us some insight. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one only son. Even though God had said to him, it's through your son Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. He said, all right, if this is what God wants me to do, I know that God's promised me that my son is going to be the father of a great nation with me, so if I kill him, God can and will raise him from the dead. So he raised up the knife to plunge it into the heart of his son, and he hears these words scream out across, stop! Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now that I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. You say, Todd, this is the craziest story we've ever looked at in the history of the Bible. And you're right, it's cray cray. So what's the point? God will have no other gods before him. Our God is a jealous God. And this is the ultimate test. Is there anything rivaling your love for God? Is he the priority of your life? Or have you let something else creep up to be equal to him or greater than him? Let me tell you something about God. God does not share his throne. And he deserves our best. He is the priority. 
And everything else pales in comparison to him. Our love for our family, our love for money, our love for fame, our love for whatever. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is worthy of all praise and all glory. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Savior of our soul. And he deserves our very best every single day. So here's how it works, friends. You ready? Because this whole thing I know is tough. Because I've been failing these tests for years. But here's what I've learned. When you're in your right mind, and you hold your life like this, and you say, God, whatever, whenever, however, he can bless you. He can heap blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But when you hold on to your life, when you say, you will not have a part of this, I will love this more than you. When you hold on to your life, God can't bless you anymore. So what should we do? We should hold loosely to the things of this world, and we should hold on to Jesus with white knuckle intensity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to pass these tests. Help us to be faithful as you've been faithful to us. Lord, wherever you want us to go, whenever, however, may the answer be yes. And Lord, for those of us who find ourselves in your waiting room, waiting on a test result, waiting on a pregnancy, waiting on a marriage, waiting on a job, waiting on whatever, may we hope in you. May you renew our strength. May we mount up like wings like eagles. God, may there be no rival to you. You deserve everything we've got. The best worship, the best praise, the best offering, the best sacrifice. Every moment, every day, be in your hands and be in your feet. This is what you've called us to. This is the adventure that you've asked us to enter into. So God, help us. Help us to hold loosely to the things of this world and to hold on to you with everything we've got. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.